Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My pleasure to welcome you here to the Policy Exchange and to this special lecture for the Judicial Power Project. Uh, my name is Richard Evans. I teach law at Oxford and I lead the, the project. Uh, as some of you will know, the Judicial Power Project has a general concern to explain the logic, the value, the balance of the Westminster Constitution, and in particular, how it uh, arranges, how it balances powers and responsibilities, and to question the, the recent expansion of judicial power um, in that context. The Miller judgment has been of great interest to us, as you might expect, and we're delighted to be able to arrange to host this lecture today on the prerogative, Parliament, and the relationship between the two and the courts. My particular pleasure to introduce our lecturer today, Professor Timothy Endicott. Uh, Timothy is one of the world's leading legal philosophers, one of Britain's leading academic public lawyers, professor of legal philosophy in the University of Oxford, fellow of Balliol College, Dean of the Faculty of Law for, uh, for eight years until just last year. His uh, published works include a great many articles, but especially his book, The Vagueness of the Law, makes a, a very important contribution to the philosophy of language and the philosophy of law, and especially his treatise on administrative law, on the way in which the law controls the administration, uh, both for good and occasionally for ill. And that's a masterful study of the law of the Constitution, the administrative law of the land book that I refer to often and to my profits. Well, Professor Indicon has been very supportive of the Judicial Power Project since its inception, and it's my great pleasure to invite him to address us now. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll tell you something curious about our long constitutional history, brilliant, disastrous history of thinking and acting, but there's a gap in it, uh, or so I think. I look at, and if I'm wrong, I, I do someone do tell me. Um, <coughs> but as far as I can see, 950 years of thought and action since the conquest have yielded no articulate account of the principle or principles that explain and justify executive power in our constitution. Um, I'm not going to try to prove this negative hypothesis. As you can tell, I'm not even sure it's true. Uh, the hypothesis that no one has ever given a decent theory of the executive. But I can show you some scenes from the historical pageant uh, that will persuade you that it may be true. Um, these amazing scenes would be comic if they did not involve the violence and terror of a long struggle against abuse of the executive power. Um, I think that if, by an effort of imaginative reconstruction, we distilled a theory from things that people have said, the theory would be that the executive power of the crown is a stubborn stain, that we have only partly succeeded in washing out of the fabric of our constitution. Um, and then, having put those scenes before you, I'm going to, it, 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 and, and there's not enough sort of analytical substance in those scenes uh, to take us very long. It's going to leave time for me to make an argument, which is that the stubborn stain theory is deficient and damaging. There's a constitutional rationale for the power of the executive in the 21st century, and if we don't know what the executive is there for, we cannot understand the fetters that ought to constrain, do constrain <coughs> this dangerous branch of government, the branch with the guns, and then we cannot understand the proper relation between Parliament and the prerogative. I'm not accusing our forebears in legal and political practice and thinking of a failure in constitutionalism. This gap is understandable. The lack of any organized account of the constitutional basis for executive power is partly explained by a mere accident of our constitutional history. It's a very structural and massively important accident that the power of the executive has evolved negatively by subtraction through progressive shifts of particular powers, first away from the monarch in person and lately away from her ministers in their exercise of prerogative in her, in her name. That process of sub subtraction has captivated our collective constitutional imagination and has given the stubborn stain theory some plausibility. And there are also reasons for the gap in theorizing that are of importance generally for understanding executive functions in any constitution. One reason for the gap is that the essential points are so obvious. And I'll 
I'll, I'll tell you what they are. Um, the essential points have largely gone without saying. Another reason for the gap is that the power that the executive ought to have cannot be specified very generally, as it depends on conditions of politics and of culture in a particular country and on the country's strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And all that does not lend itself to theory. I will argue that even though we have inherited no theory justifying executive power, we can actually find in our heritage some small hints of great importance, simple elements that explain why the executive has a legitimate function justifiable in constitutional principle. And those small hints show that the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty are not the only principles of our constitution. Before I get into the scenes from our history, let me explain why this lecture um, is inspired by an instant classic of constitutional law, the divisional court's decision in the Miller case. Um, I agree with an account that Lord Millet recently gave in the UK Supreme Court yearbook of the claimant's main argument in the case. I'll, I'll read it to you. All the rights, Lord Millet says, on which the claimants relied in Miller have been imported into domestic law in the terms in which they are granted by the treaties, and all are inherently dependent on the maintenance of an existing relationship between the, EU, the EU, UK and the EU. Any change in that relationship between the, the UK and the EU is a classic example of something which may be effected by the exercise of the royal prerogative without the need for legislation. Um, for reasons that Lord Millet and John Finnis have explained, it's a fallacy to say that if Parliament has enacted a statute giving effect to rights ar arising under a treaty, the government cannot take action that would terminate those rights. That's what I think. Um, but still, I think, there would be a ground for judges to uphold Mrs. Miller's claim if it were constitutionally intolerable for the executive branch of government to be taking this dramatic step, a step in managing that relationship, UK-EU, that will presumably result in the end of our, our membership in the EU. And the stubborn stain theory supports this view, that the court ought to take away from the British government the power to terminate EU membership on urgent grounds of constitutional propriety, um, as Sir Edward Cook denied the king the power that he claimed in 1610 to raise revenue by inventing his own town planning scheme for London, complete with expensive fees, um, in the case of proclamations. Gina Miller, um, when she was interviewed on Radio 4 the week before the hearing in, in her case, called the authority of the British government in international relations this ancient secret of royal prerogative. Um, I think she, the, the word royal and the word prerogative sound like per, pejorative terms, and secretive is. When she was interviewed, uh, she also referred to the case of proclamations to support her view that the government cannot deprive us of rights that Parliament gave effect to in the European Communities Act. Uh, the divisional court in the Miller case accepted that approach, accepted that the reasoning of the case of proclamations su supported her claim. And in the account they gave of our Constitution, all of its principles, all the principles articulated in the decision, either restrict the authority of the Crown or empower agencies other than the Crown, empower the courts and empower Parliament. There's no indication in the judgment of any principle of the Constitution that justifies any executive power whatsoever. Um, and if the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty are our, our principles, it, it can seem as if the royal prerogative is an unprincipled remnant of arbitrary power waiting to be taken away in a, in a case where, as in Miller, there's a matter of constitutional importance at stake. And then the court's decision, the divisional court's decision, seems to take its place in a venerable history of progressive transfer of power from the autocratic crown to the democratic parliament over there, and the independent courts over there. If there's no rationale for executive power in our constitution, if, it, if it's a regrettable residue of arbitrary medieval despotism, then you may say the judges ought to seize the moment and remove a prerogative that they had not had any earlier occasion to remove. But I'm going to argue that the stubborn stain theory is mistaken, that the picture of the prerogative that arises from the stubborn stain theory is askew, there's no constitutional ground for taking this power away from the executive. 
is actually no general reason to take power away from the executive. The great historical successes have been successes in taking particular powers away for particular reasons. And it's equally important not to take away the powers from the executive that it really ought to have. What are those powers? What powers should the executive have? Let's turn to the pageant that I promised you, um, only to be sorely disappointed, I, I assure you. Um, and we can, let's start, why not, with Magna Carta. The pageant's actually older than 1215. Um, it's older than King Knut's Oxford Code, which I hope we'll be celebrating the millennium of uh, in 2018. Uh, but let's start with the list that the barons wrote in the Runnymede Charter in 1215 that successive kings edited in successive Magna Cartas the list of things that the king was not meant to do. Within weeks of him agreeing to his agreeing to the list, the Pope adjudged that the Runnymede Charter would have been voidable for the duress that they subjected him to if it weren't actually void as an insult to the authority of the king, the dignity of the king. And the Pope's judgments would, I submit with respect, have been sound if the Charter had not, by and large, set out the law as it was well understood to have been long before King John's coronation, the restrictions on his power, established by authoritative custom of the realm. The constitutional importance of the Runnymede Charter is first, its illustration of the claim of the rich men of the country to legitimacy in constraining the king, and secondly, its nature as a list of things the king could not do. The Charter did not set out the legitimate scope of the king's authority. It, it's a pattern for 800 year tradition since of presupposing the executive power of the crown and then identifying restrictions on it and establishing techniques for constraining it. Uh, 1471, John Fortescue, given time to think about things while in France after his patron was deposed in the Wars of the Roses, distinguished the purely regal authority of what we might call an absolute monarch from the regal and political authority of what we might call a constitutional monarch. Under purely regal authority, the king's pleasure has the force of law. Regal and political kingship, by contrast, is what England had, or was meant to have. And in that form of constitution, the king rules a people after their wanting, I love that word wanting, their, their unifying of themselves into a realm. And he rules by such laws as they would all assent to. Uh, Fortescue wrote in France that the French model was purely regal. And the <coughs> essential difference is that the purely regal king can raise revenue from the commons without their assent. And that, he said, was the difference from England. In France, as a result of regal rule that was not political, the co commoners were reduced to poverty. They drink in water. They eat in apples with bread right brown made of rye. They eat in no flesh. But if it be right, seldom a little lard, or of the entrails and heads of beasties slain for the nobles and merchants of the land. Lo, this is the fruit of his jus regale. That's what Fortescue had to say about France. He favored the regal and political English model. Um, and his constitutional imagination, like the imagination of the barons in 1215, was focused on the how, how the king is and ought to be constrained, and not on justifying the executive power. Sir Edward Cook, um, when he said, in the case of prohibitions, face to face to King James, that the king could not sit in judgment in, persons, in person in the law courts, the king was so infuriated that he threatened with his fist to strike Cook down, and Cook fell on his face in fear and begged for pity. And this vignette is an emblem of the reason why Cook, <coughs> I think, did not come up with a theory of executive power. That power was a matter of awe and fear <coughs> uh, to be taken for granted by judges to whom it actually meant something to call the king his majesty. Cook said obsequious things in that judgment about King James, that God had endowed his majesty with excellent science and great endowments of nature. And he was careful to ascribe the king's disqualification from sitting as a judge to the fact that he had not studied law rather than to its true essential constitutional ground in the need for a separation of judicial power to prevent abuse of executive power. In the case of proclamations, the Lord Chancellor, arguing on behalf of the king, hinted, hinted at a theory of executive power when he argued that if James could not 
conduct his get-rich schemes, get-rich-quick schemes when the Parliament wouldn't give him the revenue he wanted. He would be no more than the Duke of Venice. Um, and the Doge at that point was a sort of figurehead for an oligarchy. Uh, that's all we get in the case, and it's not from Cook. Cook's holding about the king's power was almost entirely negative, outlining what the law prevented the king from doing and reconciling it with his dignity, but giving no positive explanation as to why the king had any authority. For example, the authority to make proclamations. There was simply no call for Cook to explain or justify the power of the king. It was presumed unarticulated, meant to be a mystery. Constitutional progress was made, was to be made by limiting it in particular ways rather than piercing the mystery with an account of its justification. Now, uh, you would think that from John Locke, at least, we would get a theory of the executive. And here we do, in fact, get those small hints that I I foreshadowed something really valuable and pertinent, pertinent about executive power, but we don't get a good theory. I'm, I'm sorry to say, um, Locke said in his second treatise on civil government um, that the legislators, legislature's laws have lasting force and they need a perpetual execution. It's necessary that there should be a power always in being to see the execution of the laws that are made and remain in force. I think that Locke, a man who was really sensitively aware of the misleading charms that words can have, I think he was charmed by the word executive. And if we use the word executive as a term for a branch of government, it cannot possibly be merely a branch that executes laws. <coughs> Executing laws is a crucial, complex responsibility um, that is only one fragment of what we need from the executive branch of government. And very significantly for our purposes, Locke added another power alongside legislative, judicial, and executive powers. The power of war and peace, leagues and alliances, all the transactions with all persons and communities without the commonwealth may be called federative, if anyone pleases. So the thing be understood, I'm indifferent as to the name, he says. Um, and he says that the federative power, in the well or ill management of it, it's of great moment to the Commonwealth, yet it is much less capable to be directed by antecedent standing positive laws than the executive. Um, Locke added that because both have to use force on behalf of the community, the executive and federative functions ought to be unified in one agency, because allocating authority over use of force to different offices would be apt sometime or other to cause disorder and ruin. So here are the lessons we can learn from Locke. That the federative power is distinct from the legislative, that the power to execute laws is distinct too, and that responsibility for the use of force by the state ought to be unified. And finally, a real theory of executive power would have to account for aspects of government that, like the federative power, as, he, as Locke put it, depend on the variation of designs and interests that, he, that foreigners might have and must be left to the prudence of those who have the power committed them to them to be managed to the best of their skill for the advantage of the Commonwealth. Now, I think that this is a mere fragment and we have to add something crucial. Domestic policy formation and policy implementation too, not only relations with foreigners, involve what Locke called people's actions and the variation of designs and interests and must be left in great part to officials of the state who are not legislators subject to the carrying out of truly legislative and judicial functions by the judiciary and the legislature. Um, now, in Locke's discussion of prerogative, there's also some wisdom, much wisdom, including a hint at a crucial point about the open-endedness of the government's responsibility in domestic as well as foreign affairs. Many things there are, he said, which the law can by no means provide for, and those must necessarily be left to the discretion of him that has the executive power in his hands to be ordered by him as the public good and advantage shall require. But Locke doesn't carry through, and it's clouded by a suggestion he makes that that's because the legislature is slow. And so we need executive officials, for reasons of timing, who will bring to the legislature for decision the matters that they have to deal with in a hurry since they're at work 24 hours a day. Now, I think that those 
the examples that Locke gives are not the only example of the diversity of needs that may or may not call for legislation, and we need executive officials to deal with needs and to decide whether they need to be dealt with in legislation in a way that Locke really didn't uh, get to. Did William Blackstone get to it? He learned from Locke. And you might have thought so, because he was more vocally concerned than Locke or even Sir Edward Cook had been with the division of powers in the Constitution. Um, but he, too, uh, in his lectures in Oxford, which became his commentaries in the 1760s, took the proper extent of executive power mostly for granted. He was, unlike Locke, um, and it's a credit to Locke, I think, Blackstone was still treating executive power as a highfalutin mystery. Um, he said, those branches of the royal prerogative which invest this our sovereign lord thus all perfect and immortal in his kingly capacity with a number of authorities and powers in the exertion whereof consists the executive part of government. It, he, he put a spiritual aura over the, the institution of the crown um, that rather obscures what we're looking for if we're looking for its executive responsibility and authority. But we do get one essential practical detail. I, maybe he got it from Locke concerning the allocation of the executive power, which is that it ought to be unified. This, is, this executive power is wisely placed in a single hand by the British Constitution for the sake of unanimity, strength, and dispatch. Were it placed in many hands, it would be subject to many wills. Many wills, if disunited, if draw in different ways, create weakness in the government. And to unite those several wills is a work of more time and delay than the exigencies of state will afford. Um, Blackstone's account of executive power is out of date. Uh, he didn't foresee judges reviewing exercises of the prerogative. I think he exaggerated the necessity for unification in a single person, which was obviously in, in, you know, the, in the single person of the all-perfect and immortal uh, king, all-perfect and immortal in his kingly capacity. Uh, the kings for generations, for centuries, um, had been uh, ruling in a council of ministers who could not only do what he said, told them to do, but act on his behalf. But, but Blackstone's point about the need for unification of the executive function, his offhand remark is a currently salient reminder that, in my view, we would not be better governed if Parliament or the House of Commons were responsible for a negotiation of the European Union. Um, what about Albert Van Dyssey? Um, uh, the great constitutional scholar, great teacher, hopeless uh, in my view on our subject, and we owe him a large part of the discredit for the stubborn stain theory. Uh, Dicey described the prerogative as the residue of discretionary or arbitrary authority which at any time, given time, is legally left in the hands of the crown. Um, we, we ought to do Dicey justice. So I will immediately point out that Albert Ben Dicey did not actually hold the stubborn stain theory. By arbitrary, I think he probably only meant that the person who exercises the power, the queen or her ministers, as maybe, is the arbiter. And he gave a characteristically careful and sensitive account of the role of the prerogative, of the role of convention in regulating and constraining its use, and of the relation between its exercise and the authority of the House of Commons. Um, but he ought to have known better. He ought to have foreseen that generations of writers and students in exams would cite Dicey only for short phrases taken out of context, and that they would take from his sensitive account not a well-informed sense of the constitutional appropriateness of the prerogative, but only two pejorative misconceptions that the prerogative is a residue and that it's arbitrary. Um, now, I'm going to hurtle through, we can, we can all hurtle through the 20th century and into the 21st century, witnessing the legacy of this tradition of thinking, in which the executive power of the state is treated as something to be taken away and not something that calls for and may have a justification, because it's all summed up in the Miller decision. The divisional court described the prerogative in Dicey's way as the residue of legal authority left in the hands of the crown. They cited Lord Reed, the great judge in the 60s, saying that the prerogative is, in a, in a decision of the House of Lords, the prerogative is really a relic of a past age, not lost by disuse, he says, of 
something rather regretful, um, but only available for a case not covered by statute. Um, the judges in the Miller case quoted Lord Brown Wilkinson's remark in the Fire Brigade's Union case that the constitutional history of this country is the history of the prerogative powers of the Crown being made subject to the overriding powers of the democratically elected legislature <coughs> as a sovereign body. And the judges in Miller affirmed the principles of the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty. In their portrayal of our Constitution, its success is the subordination of the prerogative power to Parliament and the courts. And they cited the case of proclamations for both forms of subordination. And there is no indication in the judgment of any justification for the proposition that the Crown ought to have any power whatsoever. And this gap can be observed generally in political thought, not only in judicial deliberation. The Labour government in 2007 produced a green paper on the role of the executive that supported the stubborn stain theory. For centuries, the, it starts out by saying, for centuries the executive has in certain areas been able to exercise authority in the name of the monarch without the people and their elected representatives in their parliament being consulted. This is no longer appropriate in a modern democracy. The government's review in and uh, leading from the Green Paper uh, led to some extraordinarily sensible decisions by Prime Minister Gordon Brown that he should not be choosing Regis professors in the universities or bishops. Um, but notice the particularity of those healthy withdrawals of power from the Queen's Prime Minister. They are particular powers and there are particular reasons, in my view, um, for concluding that the Prime Minister is not best placed to exercise the power of appointing professors or the power of appointing bishops for the public good. And the mistake in the background to the Brown's government's review and woven into its final report two years later was to generalize as if the holding by the Prime Minister of a power not conferred on him by Parliament were generally disreputable and illegitimate. And that impulse to generalize, the gist of the stubborn stain theory, is a popular impulse today, at least with regard to those powers that wear the irresponsible sounding label prerogative. Now, um, th this approach to prerogative is supported by the trend and rhetoric of our constitutional theory, the approach of viewing it as a, a power that is uh, regrettable, ancient, secretive, waiting to be taken away by the judges in the exercise of their responsibility for the rule of law and in the exercise of their responsibility for giving effect to the sovereignty of Parliament. Um, and that approach is encouraged by the word royal, the word prerogative, and the phrase the crown. Um, no doubt for some of our colleagues who pursue it, that approach is actuated by a Republican urge which finds it offensive that real power today should have its theoretical and historical source in a regal heritage, even if it's always been, according to John Fortescue. Since Brutus came to this country in the aftermath of the Trojan War, it's always been regal and political in England. Um, but the, that approach to the prerogative is prone to discount or ignore two points of huge constitutional importance. I will say there are two principles of our Constitution. And the first is the, the value, not just the value, but the sheer need, constitutional necessity, of an efficient and unified executive branch of government. And the second is the possibility, in theory, and the reality, the actuality in, in this country today, that the executive branch of government can be a responsible branch of government rather than an arbitrary or despotic branch. And I'm immediately going to stop parenthetically and and, and insist that I'm not here as an apologist for the executive or any government. Um, and, and when you hear me using the capital, pronouncing the word government with a capital G, it means the prime minister and the other ministers of the crown. I'm not here as an apologist for them any more or less than for the legislature or the judiciary. I think that constitutional theorists, the attitude, all of our attitude ought to be a really thoroughgoing, dogged skepticism about our, all of our rulers. Not those in this room personally, <laughs> but um, all of them impersonally. Um, what a blessing to be able to take that attitude. Um, to live in England, to live in this neighborhood, to stand in this neighborhood um, in a day when uh, the judges are not on their hands and knees in front of the monarch. 
Um, let's extend the skepticism about rulers. Um, doubtfulness as to their wisdom, understanding of public affairs, even their goodwill to the voters exercising power as our rulers in an election or a referendum. Let's extend it very liberally to the executive, both houses of parliament, local councils, European Council, the United Nations, governments of other countries, their voters and our voters. Um, these questions that we're talking about, questions of people's governance, should be answered in a way that makes room for greatness on the part of the rulers and also in a way that delivers responsible government in the face of stupidity and worse on the part of their rulers. And so it's, I'm not making a great elegy to the British government when I say that we should apply to them, the government with a capital G, the ministers of the crown, only the same dog of skepticism that we apply to other rulers, including voters. Um, the stubborn stain theory of our constitution risks idolizing judges and parliament. And that's a form of naivety. Um, needless to say, it, it might be a preferable form of naivety to the naivety of forgetting the distinctive special massively effective capacity of the executive branch of government to abuse power. But let's not be naive at all. Um, so with that proviso, here are the two constitutional principles that justify executive power. And the first is that the executive is necessary for the public good. In every constitution, in every political community, the executive is the primary general branch of government. The functions of the executive are open-ended while the core judicial function of passing judgment on legal claims and the core legislative functions of passing judgment on proposals for legislation are specific governmental functions taking specific forms. The courts and the legislature, Locke noticed this, can close for vacations, and the executive cannot. The executive does not manage the country. Nobody manages the country, but the executive manages the police and the military. It gives effect to decisions in the courts and the legislature. It's the executive that is chiefly responsible for the rule of law, not the courts and not the legislature. Parliament can change the Constitution. The courts can determine the law of the Constitution, but it's the government that must uphold the Constitution. And there you heard the capital G. Um, now, these observations, your eyes will blaze over. They may seem banal. Um, but they show the mistake in the seemingly attractive idea that prerogative power ought generally to be taken away from the government. Instead, the constitutional imperatives are and have been for a thousand years um, to make the executive democratic and responsible and to take away specifically legislative and adjudicative powers that the crown cannot responsibly discharge. Responsible government needs an effective agency for making clear, open, prospective, general, stable rules of law for the community. Responsible government needs an independent and effective agency to resolve disputes over the rules. So the case of proclamations and the case of prohibitions del Roy were not great achievements of Sir Edward Cook because they took away power from the king. They were great achievements of Sir Edward Cook because they took away specific powers that the constitution could not responsibly allocate to the king. The success of our separation of powers is not that the executive is less powerful than in Fortescue's day. The success is much more specific. It is the separation of the power of judging and the power of legislation, preeminently legislation to impose taxes from the executive. Legislation is the making of clear, open, prospective, general, stable laws for the regulation of those aspects of the life of the community that ought to be regulated by law take taxation as the paradigm. Tax collecting is an executive function, but there's no better example of an aspect of our life in a community that ought to be regulated by clear, open, prospective, general, stable laws. And the power to make those rules had better be separated from the say-so of the tax collectors. And this has been a driver of our constitutional history. Think of Magna Carta, Fortescue, what Fortescue had to say about what they have to eat in France case of proclamations, in each of these cases, the problem was how to constrain the king's power to raise taxes for wars and threats. Um, the executive function, by contrast with the legislative function of making general rules for the future, the executive function is to get stuff done. That's, that's the executive function. And the executive can only really be defined as those elements of government that are not the judiciary of the legislature. So there are two quite specific reasons for the separation of powers. 
not to share out power at random so that nobody has too much, but to remove the specifically judicial power from the executive and to remove the specifically legislative power from the executive. The functions of the executive branch are so various that it needs a variety of separations of power within it. We need independent prosecutors and independence of certain kinds for civil servants and of other kinds for central bankers and separate legal capacities for executive action by local authorities and school boards and others, and there are many more. And, in my view, very importantly, the function of initiating legislation is an executive function. The, the question for the legislature is to say yes or no to a proposal, or, of course, to say no but amend it, or no but yes but only on these terms. That, that, that yes or no question with variations depending on the committee structure of the legislature is the legislative question. The executive question is what is to be done. Um, and so the, the power of the, of the executive ought to be unspecific. That includes this remarkable power, not a prerogative power in our Constitution, but a power arising from the rules and practices of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Remarkable executive power of initiating legislation. So we need an executive with those remarkable powers. It ought to be constrained. It is constrained by the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty. And so it's constrained in any way that Parliament sees fit to constrain it. And it's constrained by the forms of constituent power that the court has um, from our Constitution, the power to determine the extent of executive power. Um, and on those constituent powers of the legislature to decide what the executive power will be, and of the courts to decide what it is, um, our constitutional history gives us a clear, definite theory and doctrine. Um, and a due appreciation of the constitutional importance of the constraints on that executive power seems to support the stubborn, stained view of executive power. But instead, particular powers, powers of judging, powers of levying taxes, powers of appointing professors and bishops, um, should be taken away from the crown, have been taken away from the crown. Um, it's well justified in point of constitutional principle that the government should have, I think, very roughly, the range of executive power that it has now, and in particular the powers that it has under the royal prerogative. There's no general reason to take away powers from the crown, at least as long as we have a framework for the responsible exercise of those powers. And that brings me to the second constitutional principle, that the executive can be, and in fact it is in our constitution, Exercise, that its power can be exercised responsibly. Um, it really was a great constitutional accomplishment to take particular legislative, judicial, and judicial powers away from the, the crown. I just don't think that that subtractive pattern in our constitution should distract us from the importance of the power of the executive itself. And making the executive into a constitutionally responsible agency while keeping it unified and effective was every bit, every bit as great an accomplishment of our history as giving Parliament the power it has and giving the judges the power that they have. Um, in Blackstone's time, the House of Commons control over revenue was already generating a political necessity for the monarch to have ministers who could command the confidence of the House of Commons. By the 1860s, the time of the terrific journalist of, of the Constitution, Walter Badgett, we had cabinet government, and to him that was the efficient wonder of our Constitution. Today, in our Constitution, the government, that's the capital G, the agency responsible for the executive branch of government, is itself democratic, as Badgett pointed out and democratic in several respects. The Prime Minister is appointed through a democratic process and she'll only be reappointed after the next election through a democratic process, if she is. Um, she does not, number two, she does not govern alone, um, but as the chair of the cabinet. And that arrangement enhances democracy by requiring the Prime Minister to achieve cooperation from a group of the senior leadership of her party. And Badgett pointed out the importance of, of that aspect of the cabinet. Thirdly, she and her cabinet are accountable to the Conservative Party. We shouldn't forget the importance of that 
accountability. It's a serious constraint magnified by the fact that there's a group of those senior leaders. Um, Fourthly, she and the rest of the cabinet are accountable to the Democratic Chamber of Parliament through its procedures and also through their need, absolute need, for its confidence. They're also accountable in different ways to the House of Lords. Fifthly, they're subject to the legislative supremacy of Parliament and to the orders of the courts. And sixthly, uniquely, for government institutions, they, and that, that was a small g, um, they have an opposition. Uh, the judges in the legislature have none. Uh, we can criticize the judges. <laughs> Um, we can criticize Parliament, but no one has the institutionalized constitutional responsibility and institutionalized effective day-to-day -day opportunity to stand against the policies of the judges in the Parliament. Um, in 2016, the need for a unified and effective executive combined with those democratic features of our government justifies the authority of the British government in its leadership of the executive in general and in managing international relations in particular. The executive is not generally democratic, but the government, with the big G, really is. Uh, I think the cabinet is a thousand times more democratic than parliament. Um, and it's not simply because parliament includes the House of Lords. I think it's obvious, it baffles me when people talk as if parliament were the democratic institution and as if the government with a capital G were undemocratic. Um, the cabinet's from one party. Parliament does not. The government faces an opposition. Parliament does not. The cabinet's radically and vulnerably exposed to the pressure of electoral prospects. Not even the Conservative Party is as vulnerable to the wishes of the people as the cabinet is. Um, if the party loses its majority in the next election, uh, there, I predict that there will still be a lot of Conservative MPs in the House of Commons, uh, but the cabinet will be out. The Prime Minister will be gone. Um, now, uh, you don't need to, you might say that comparison of the democraticness of the, of the big G government and of the parliament is flippant. Um, you don't need to agree with me on it, just agree with me that uh, they share the government and parliament, and specifically the government and the House of Commons share democratic credentials. Dicey pointed this out with great acuity, conferring, talking about the prerogative, conferring as it does wide discretion on the cabinet, the prerogative immensely increases the authority of the House of Commons and ultimately of the constituencies by which that house is returned. Ministers must, in exercise of all discretionary powers, inevitably obey the predominant authority in the state, says Dyson. Um, I think it's a misleading and damaging idea to think of the British government as anything other than the people's representatives. The danger is dilution of the government's responsibility for executive action. If you think that the second Iraq war was a mistake, you should be wary of the propensity for a government to sail into something like that with a sense of accountability and responsibility and propriety and constitutionality garnered from the approval of the assembly. Uh, that war, which is offered by some people to show the importance of approval by parliament for the exercise of the power to go to war, shows the potential uselessness of approval by an assembly for the exercise of the power to go to war. It may conceivably be better for us to have a government that knows that it will in the future beyond the hook for executive decisions for which it may be punished by the commons or by the electors when they judge the government after the fact with the savage wisdom of hindsight. Now, I, I say that may conceivably be better. In other words, to have a government that goes to war without asking the House of Commons to vote in favor of it may conceivably be better. There's no general theoretical answer to these questions, and there can be various arrangements for the making of those decisions for holding the decision makers to account. That variety shows that there's no general principle of constitutionalism that an executive branch of government should have less rather than more power in the Constitution. I, I will wrap up um, by reminding you of the idea of the oneing of the people, as Fortescue called it. Um, the people being a political community, the oneing. Um, for that purpose, for us to be a political community, it tends to be essential to have independent judges applying clear, open, prospective, stable rules of law. And it tends to be essential to have a legislature with some independence from the executive with authority to bind the executive by legislation. And those general truths are given form in the two famous principles of the Constitution, the ones that you get in the Miller case, 
the rule of law and the sovereignty of Parliament. Um, and I think it may be good for the legislature as an assembly on behalf of the people, not only to have its legislative authority, but to have the executive authority that the House of Commons has to appoint and dismiss the leadership of the executive. Now, the stubborn stain view, uh, with its centuries-old tradition of indiscriminate suggestions that there's something generally wrong with constitutional executive power, is a mistake because of the two further constitutional principles. The principle that a unified and effective executive branch of government is necessary for the public good, and the principle that the executive itself can be configured for responsible exercise of power. Now, we can say all those things, I think, point out the importance of those two constitutional principles, while holding on tenaciously to skepticism about rulers. The skepticism about rulers may incline you to think that the purpose of a constitution is to constrain them, to constrain power. But we're treating a fragment of the Constitution as a whole if we think that constraining power is its whole purpose. In fact, the purpose of the Constitution is to empower and to constrain as may best enable us to live as a community. I think that the claimant's case in the Miller litigation depends on the stubborn stain theory. Uh, but I've argued against that theory that there is no general reason to take power willy-nilly away from the government with the capital G. And there's no specific reason to take this particular constitutional power away from the executive. Remember the trigger to write a letter to the European Council indicating the United Kingdom's intention to withdraw from the EU. Um, it may seem, it has seemed to many, that there is reason to take that constitutional power away from the executive because it's so clearly um, a matter of constitutional significance. But it all is, a, and that's true, but it's so clearly and patently a matter of whether and how to inst instigate a negotiation. And the process of legislation in Parliament has nothing to offer to that decision whether and when to send a letter to the European Council. Nothing to offer that would make the decision more responsible um, in, the, in the current situation. Um, and you see how different this is from the case of proclamations, which involved a scheme to raise revenue that King James could not get by grant of parliament. In, imagine that Theresa May, that, that they weren't able to, the government, the capital G, the, the conservative government were not able to raise the revenue that she and the cabinet considered themselves to need for the purposes of government. And she instituted a scheme for prohibiting building without buying a very expensive license from the British government. Uh, then we'd have a case on all fours with the case of proclamations. Um, so I, for, for these long-winded reasons, I reached the same conclusion that Lord Millet reached very swiftly. Any change in the relationship between the UK and the EU is a classic example of something which may be affected by the exercise of the royal prerogative without the need for legislation. Now, using the royal prerogative in that way would be entirely consistent with parliamentary sovereignty. Um, and parliament has and ought to have an actual current central role in the business of Brexit, whether to trigger Article 50, on what terms, and so on. It's all, it's all in discussion over there. Um, through all, for, all sorts of forms of debate and scrutiny in both houses, in a variety of forms, in, in committee, in, um, through the opposition's capacity to ask questions and to call for debates, through debates in government time, and primarily through the confidence of the House of Commons in Theresa May's government. I, it takes no close familiarity with the political workings of the House of Commons to know that there's no prospect of success for a motion of no confidence on grounds of her int intention to use the prerogative to trigger Article 50 in present conditions. Um, ironically, some have suggested that the fact that Theresa May retains the confidence of the House of Commons while proposing to trigger Article 50 shows that Parliament must have some other role um, than it already does have um, in this matter of constitutional significance. Um, I'll stop at Fortescue on, on French food Cook lying flat on his face, Blackstone calling the king all perfect and immortal, um, Dicey and everyone else talking as if some bleach in the wash would finally remove this residue 
Um, the, you will find poignant and absurd scenes in the constitutional history. Don't let them mislead you. If you want my advice, if you're writing a constitution for this country or any other, put an executive branch in it. It's necessary, and as long as it's under control, um, it may work out tolerably well, even if the scope of its power is unspecific and under-theorized. Thanks. We have time for a few questions, uh, and this gentleman in the back there. I was just going to ask, accepting... No, sorry, um, microphone's coming, and it's in fact the Minister of the Crown, so we'll... We'll give them the microphone to start off. You can announce who you are, it'd be very helpful. No okay. question too outrageous, but some might be too long, so get them short. Uh, okay, thanks. I'm sorry, uh, Jesse, you're not speaking as minister, but speaking as academic. Um, so much to agree with, so much to disagree with in that. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just say one thing? Just, I, I think you're um, quite unfair and accurate to um, Sir Edward Cook. Um, I mean, by the time you get to the case of populations, um, Cook is definitely a man in transition from um, his status as a um, uh, uh, pro monarchy or bully boy. Um, but he's also well established in promoting common law um, and the physical strengths on the monarch that that implies, according to his theory of the ancient constitution. So to say he doesn't have a theory of um, uh, 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 the executive, at a time when the executive branch is in no sense a fully fledged area of government and parliament sits irregularly, uh, is, it seems to me, both unfair to him. Um, the man who was, after all, the protagonist and author of the Petition of Right uh, later, a man who was fell foul of the king and was uh, imprisoned by him, and who fought a running battle against him in the 1610s and 20s, um, and also unfair to our own constitutional history. Um, the only other observation I'll make quickly is that, of course, Blackstone is a naive wick, um, so one shouldn't take anything he says seriously. The real question is whether the 18th century, whether well, the 17th century should be read as a a uh, progressive Whig story of the parliamentary growing parliamentary power, or as um, a more Tory type story of the clever absorption of parliamentary power by an effective monarchy. Uh, can I uh, respond? Uh, look, uh, it, it, it grieves me um, if I've been unfair to Sir Edward Cook. Um, and I, I did not mean to say that he didn't have a, a theory of the executive. I, I meant to say that he, his theory of the executive was a theory of restraints upon it. And, uh, and, and I think that both those cases, establishing it in a certain fashion for a certain time, in ways that weren't reliably established until the <coughs> glorious revolution, this, uh, and, and in fact after, until the 18th century, the independence of judges and the legislative authority of parliament and the limits on the king's own authority. Those are landmarks, a great accomplishment, and so is the rest of what he did in, in the common law, in, in the role of the king's bench as a, as a forum for the restraint of arbitrary use of day-to-day -day executive power. Um, what I did mean to say, and I hope is not unfair to him, is that he never had to explain why it might be a good thing, why it might be supported by the principles of the constitution, that the king should be able to do anything, to wage war on another country. He does, I'm not aware that, and, and again, he wrote so much, so tell me if I've missed it, but I'm not aware that he ever has to say, and, and I, I wanted to suggest in my lecture that he didn't have to say why the king should have any authority. That's all. Uh, so, up the front here, please. So, hold some hands. General at the front here. Look, my name's Ian Orr, I'm a retired diplomat, uh, and I'd be interested in your views on the extent to which the way in which the UK's overseas territories are governed are examples of the use of the royal prerogative, but also <coughs> of the ability of the judiciary to review the use made of the royal prerogative. And is it not an important difference that in the case of uh, triggering Article 50, the judiciary is being asked to tell the executive that it can't <coughs> do something, that it's illegal in advance, rather than judging the illegality of the action that has been taken. 
But if it did do that, if it were to find that it, that, that process had, in its view, been illegal or irrational, I'm not sure it would be irrational, uh, would they need to offer a remedy? Uh, it's, look, it's fascinating that w one of the changes from Blackstone's day is that today the judges will not only decide whether the government has a power it claims to be exercising, but will also pass judgment on the procedural fairness and, as you put it, the rationality um, of the exercise of the power. And after the referendum on leaving the European Union, many lawyers started thinking, why doesn't somebody go to court and ask the courts to say that no reasonable prime minister, no rational prime minister, would trigger Article 50. And you'll notice that's missing from the arguments of the claimants in the <coughs> Miller case. And suppose Theresa May had written a, a letter to the European Council the day after the, not, she, she wouldn't have been in a position to do it, but as soon as she becomes prime minister, suppose she'd immediately written a letter to the, council, to the European Council. What if you went to court and asked the judges to say that she had exercised the prerogative unlawfully by doing something irrational, well, judges wouldn't want to touch it, and I think counsel for the claimants in the Miller litigation were right to decide that they didn't want to ask the judges to pass judgment on the rationality of triggering Article 50, but only to argue that triggering Article 50 would deprive people of statutory rights, as counsel called it again and again in the, in the litigation. Um, so I think it is quite important that we're dealing with um, the Article 50 litigation before the trigger has been pulled. It, it, uh, I mean, for one thing, a, a good judge, if, 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 if Theresa May had written the letter and then some, someone went to the very same divisional court the day after she'd written the letter and the process had been, as both sides ag agree in the, for the purpose of the litigation, inexorably begun, presumably the divisional court would have said, we don't want to touch it now that Article 50 has been triggered. Uh, one more question, right? The short the lady on the end just there. Uh, no, right next one, your left. Hey. Yes. Um, it's just to pick up on, on that point. Um, you're right that the, the claimants in the Miller case have made it, uh, made the argument about abuse of power, but the uh, claimants in the Northern Irish case have made that argument. They, they've argued that um, if this is a matter of prerogative, um, to exercise it, having failed to take account of the particular problems for Northern Ireland, would be to fail to take account of the relevant consideration. But you're also right, um, this just require in the Northern Irish High Court said non justiciable But to pick up on that, I agree with you that it's not irrational to have, to trigger the property, to use the property to trigger Article 50 in the circumstances we're faced <coughs> now. But the, the, the point has been made that well, if you accept that this power exists, you'd also have to accept it would be lawful to trigger Article 50, even if there hadn't been a referendum that the government, yeah. Theresa May, could have woken up one morning and just yeah. decided to take that yeah. view. Well, Good. Yeah. yeah, let's let's imagine the scenario. Uh, the Prime Minister wakes up one morning in a really bad temper. <laughs> <laughs> but not Theresa May. Let's say some other unnamed Prime Minister, and there's been no referendum. It could have been Gordon Brown, or because Article 50, came, when did it come in? 2007. It could have been David Cameron. Some prime minister, it's been no referendum, but they're just fed up and they write a letter saying the United Kingdom intends to withdraw, and it starts this inexorable process, and two years later, the United Kingdom is not a, um, a member state. Look, uh, fix your mind on that hypothesis, and, and the absurdity of it reflects what I think. Um, what I tried to say in my lecture, that the use of the royal prerogative is actually a responsible form of government in our country, because that hypothetical scenario is conceivable in our imaginations and not a practical political reality. We're only here because of the <coughs> referendum. Um, and uh, so just as a, a prime minister might order some you can, you know, with, now that our imaginations are running wild, you can imagine a prime minister ordering the nuclear bombing of another country tomorrow morning. Same, uh, same, same impossibility, pra practical political impossibility because of responsible government in this country. 
which is only sustained um, by the political culture and by the by the dispositions of those people and by the pressures that they're under. You know, I don't I, I don't reckon it's the law that prevents the prime minister from sending nuclear bombers to another country at three in the morning. Um, it's the politics. Well, now let me invite Lord Strathclyde to deliver a vote of thanks. How about? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> I should have stayed on, on my seat for a minute or two longer. Um, <laughs> Professor Endicott has given us a masterclass on the workings of the British Constitution. He's given us breadth and depth, a uh, tremendous historical perspective, one of authenticity and uh, scholarship. And those of you who are already expert in this matter, I suspect will have learned a great deal. Uh, those of us who are not great experts in this have learned uh, a lot, and I am extremely grateful to you. Um, it's interesting to consider for a moment, and I was uh, leader of the Conservative Party in the House of Lords for 14 years, and therefore saw in 2005 what happened uh, after the passing of the Constitutional Reform Act, 2005, when the law lords who had played such a dignified role and purpose as uh, the Supreme Court in that house uh, were turned into a Supreme Court. And I, I'd like to suggest that the fact that the law lords were part of the legislature and understood the complexities, the dynamics, and the compromises that need to take place in passing legislation, that they may well um, have viewed this whole um, issue from a different perspective. We're now um, faced with a case in the course of the next few weeks which does raise some fundamental questions which Professor Endicott um, has uh, elucidated uh, for us. It's even more complicated than, than it was because of the role of the Northern Irish, the Welsh, and, uh, and the Scots. And uh, as, um, uh, since I think we won't get the um, hearing until early in 2017, uh, it could well be that next year starts with a proper a constitutional bang, and, the, um, and we will have to see uh, the effects that come from 